All right, we are in section 12.2, which is all about vectors. <clears throat> so what are we going to do? We're going to define and discuss some basic properties of vectors and their applications. So what is a vector? I am so glad you asked that question. So there you go. A vector is a quantity that has both magnitude and direction. Magnitude and direction. Okay, magnitude is really just a fancy way of saying the length and direction is exactly what it says. It has to be pointing in a very specific direction. So let's discuss the nature of the following items and determine if they are vectors or not. Cost of a movie ticket. Does the cost of a movie ticket have both magnitude and direction? Well, the cost of a movie ticket definitely has a magnitude because it has a value, but it doesn't have a direction. There's no specific way to, you know, point a movie ticket or something like that. So a movie ticket only has magnitude no direction. Velocity. Velocity does have a very specific magnitude and direction because velocity, say it's negative 15 meters per second. Well, the negative indicates the direction. The 15 is the magnitude. So yes, velocity is a vector. Speed, on the other hand, which is the absolute value of velocity, does not have um, is not a vector because it has no direction. It does have magnitude, but there's no direction. Speed, you know, again, could be 10, but if it's in the negative direction, you'd never know because the speed is just 10. It doesn't have the specific direction. Flight path, you know, the way a airplane flies. <clears throat> the flight path itself doesn't have a magnitude. There's no specific number associated with the flight path, but it does certainly have direction because you got to go from point A to point B. It's giving you a direction, so there is no magnitude with the flight path. Now, the flight's velocity, on the other hand, definitely has magnitude. River current. So the river current flows in a very specific direction and can be measured as a specific value. So that is going to be a vector. And in pushing something using force, again, the direction may, makes a difference and how much um, force you're exerting on the object is going to be a vector. Okay, and those are just some concrete real life examples of things. So hopefully that makes sense as to what vectors are technically. So now let's figure out how we're actually gonna represent vectors. <clears throat> if we wanted to represent the vector 4, 2, and you'll notice the little um, uh, pointy brackets there um, that's kind of like the greater than less than symbols or whatever around them. That is a vector notation. There are different vector notations. This is the one that we will most commonly use. So if we were going to represent the vector 4, 2, first of all, we're just going to go ahead and graph a standard xy plane. The reason we're doing that is because the vector 4, 2 only has x and y. We will get into three-dimensional vectors, but this one is just an x and y. So let's go 1, 2, 3, 4 out this way, 2 down that way, maybe 4 up, 1, 2, 3, 4. <clears throat> I could go in the negative direction as well, but don't really need to. So the easiest way to deal with this is the vector 2, four, excuse me, 4, 2 means the vector has to start someplace and go four to the right and two up. The easiest place to start that would be 
four to the right and two up would be to actually finish it right there. That would mean if we started at the origin and drew an arrow, as he said in the video, it is represented by an arrow. The, the arrow part is called the tip, and that part is where the vector ends. The other part without the arrow is called the, um, it's called the tail, and that's where the vector starts. So that would be the vector for two and, and notated exactly as you see it with an arrow right there. However, that's not the only place that you could have the vector for two. So that one right there is the vector for two ending at the point for two. Notice the difference in the parentheses and the, um, um, and the vector notation there. So the point notation and vector notation different. I could also put the vector for two right here. I could put the tail right there, which means the tip, if I move to the right four and up two, would end right there. That is also the vector for two. What you should see there, assuming that I did this correctly, the magnitude or the length or the distance of the vector has not changed. The direction of the vector has not changed. It is still pointing in exactly the same direction. It's just that we shifted it. I could also put the vector, you know, out here somewhere. Oops, that was way too long. I could also put the vector out there somewhere as long as it maintains its magnitude and the exact same direction or basically the angle that this thing is pointing in is exactly the same. It's exactly the same vector. All of these are the vector for two. <clears throat> so the takeaway from this is that vectors only have a direction and magnitude only have a direction and magnitude, not a set position, not a set position. Vectors can be anywhere as long as it maintains the direction and the magnitude. That's it. <clears throat> All right, now let's go ahead and look at um, how we find a vector that's not necessarily starting at an easy place. So we're going to look at our example two here. <clears throat> and I'm going to go ahead and sketch these particular points. So let's see, find the vector connected by the points two, five, and three, seven. So let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oops, did not mean to erase that. Five, six, seven, close enough. So we're gonna plot the points two, five. One, two, one, two, three, four, five. And three, seven, three, seven. <clears throat> Those are my two points. So we want to find the actual vector, which goes between here and there, that vector in green. All right, so what we call the second point is the terminal point. It's where the vector ends. Terminal point. The terminal point will be at the tip. The tail is your initial point. So if I want to find the vector, I'm basically just going to figure out how much did I move in the x direction, how much did I move in the right direction, and that's really going to be our vector. So it looks like we moved 1 in the x direction and 2 in the y direction. So from A to B, we're going to call, we'll call this A, we'll call that B, vector AB, and it's notated like that with a little half arrow thing on the top. Some people put the whole arrow, it doesn't matter. Vector AB is going to be the vector 1, comma, 2. 
And again, that vector could be technically anywhere. I could take that vector and I could shift it down to, um, you know, starting here. And as long as I go right one and up two, that's the same vector. Or I could start it, you know, um, over here to the left. As long as I go right one from here up two, something like that. That's also the same vector. All those are the same vector. Vector one, two. Okay, shouldn't be hopefully anything too challenging right there. Um, just wanted to make sure that you guys saw the basic idea. All right, adding and subtracting vectors. This is actually one of the easiest things um, <clears throat> to do. The concept behind it is probably the more important piece because the math is really, really simple. So the algebraic way of doing this is probably the easy part. We'll start act, act off with that, actually, and that's going to be easy. So algebraically, adding two vectors is very simple. If I want to take vector A and add it to vector B, I am literally going to take vector A's components, 2, 5, and add them to the components of um, vector B. So I literally add the X components together and get three, add the y components together, and get three. So adding the two vectors is very simple. You just add the x components, add the y components. That's the easy part. Geometrically, it's going to be a little bit more challenging to see. So geometrically, <clears throat> a little bit more um, challenging. So what we want to do is we want to look at <clears throat> excuse me, we want to look at the xy plane, and let's go ahead and draw vectors a and b. So vector a, we'll do that one in red, is 2, 5. So let me go ahead and put our tick marks on here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. <clears throat> I'll put a few on the bottom because I know I might need them. All right, vector a we'll do in red. So 2, 7, sorry, 2, 5, it's going to end right about there. There's vector A. Now, vector B we'll do in blue, and that's the vector 1, negative 2. So if I go right 1, down 2, that one will end right there. Well, if I was to add those two vectors, if you think of these things as being like some kind of something in motion, maybe some kind of force or something like that, you would expect that the resultant vector 3, 3 would be in between, and it is. We already know the answer is 3, 3. So if we move right 3, up 3, we're going to end someplace right about there. So the resultant vector in orange looks like that one. That's our resultant vector 3, 3. Forgot to label this bottom one here as B. But what you should be able to see is this, and this is the important part. If I were to take vector A, and if I were to take vector B, remember vector B does not have to be from the origin. I can move it anywhere. So I'm going to start it from right here at the tip of vector A. Well, if I take vector B, which is um, 1, negative 2, and go right 1, down 2, look where I end. Right there at the tip of the resultant vector. Or... If I were to go the other direction, and I were to take vector B first, and then I were to take vector A and add it to it, well, so vector B down at the bottom, and then I want to add 2, 5. So if I go right 2, up 5, I end up in exactly the same place. So what that tells us is that vector addition is commutative. It doesn't make any difference which order we do it in, which is nice. And hopefully what you can see is the geometric shape that this thing forms is a parallelogram. It's actually a really important concept. It's a parallelogram. And so let's kind of take the idea of maybe you've got, um, you know, this is going to be horrible, so I apologize for my lack of drawing skills here. Here's a person. The person has, um, it's pushing something or whatever. It's exerting a force. The person is actually using this hand right here to exert a force in this direction. <clears throat> well, actually, I should probably do that in red. 
Oops. More work for me there. There we go. In red. So that's force A. And then, I don't know, maybe they're using their foot or something like that to push along. I did not draw this very well, but maybe they're using their foot to exert um, force B. You would expect that if you're pushing a box or something like that using force A and force B, using your hand and your foot, the resultant force will be someplace in between. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly what the resultant force is. It's someplace in between the two. Okay, this really ties into a lot of physics stuff um, when we're dealing with this. But that's kind of, a, again, it's just a more of a general geometric representation. The important thing is, is that you can see that when you add the two um, vectors together, they actually form a parallelogram um, in this case because of the fact that you can add them in either direction. So does the community property appear to hold for vector addition? Yes, we already said that it does. What geometric does it uh, uh, figure does it appear to form? It is a parallelogram. Parallelogram, ogram, I don't remember. Something like that. So let's go ahead and list, before we switch pages, we are going to list some properties over here. Some properties of vectors. One. Vector addition is commutative. Again, meaning it does not matter the order that we add these vectors in. Two, if I were to take vector A and all of its components, which might be like A sub 1, A sub 2, and so on, and vector B, which would be like B sub 1, B sub 2, and so on and I were to add those together. Got my vector symbols. It is literally just adding the components. So the first component would be A sub 1 plus B sub 1. The next component would be A sub 2 plus B sub 2. And, oops, and so on. You're just adding the components together. <coughs> All of this is going to lead us into what is called the parallelogram law. All right, let's go ahead and talk about scalar multiplication. First of all, a scalar is nothing more than a number. It's just a constant of some kind. So scalar multiplication would be like taking a number like 5 and multiplying it times a vector. We're going to investigate what that does. And again, very, very simple to do. I want to make sure you guys at least see why it works. So if we were to take and add, excuse me, add vector A plus vector A, well, we can do that. That's pretty simple. We know how to do the vector addition now. Vector A plus vector A is vector 2 1 plus vector 2 1 which is going to be vector 4 2 very simple to do mathematically well a plus a is really the same thing as 2a correct so we know that 2a is the vector 4 2 which is the same thing if I factor out a 2 as 2a equaling 2 times the vector 2, 1. So hopefully, and I, I know we worked it a little bit backwards there, but hopefully you can see that that's what it is. So basically what that's saying is, if I take a scalar and I multiply it times the vector, you just distribute the scalar through every um, component of the vector. That's all you have to do. So let's take a look at it real quick as a geometric representation. So we've got the vector 2, 1, which might look something like this out to up one and then I'm going to add another vector to one so it's the same thing to get there well if you add those things then you of course you would get to the point four two or excuse me the vector four two so this would be again two one two one and you can see that the resultant vector there would be the vector four two if you add those two things together so the rule becomes 
if I take a constant and I multiply it times some vector, you just distribute the constant throughout the vector. And so on. Again, not difficult to do. Hopefully you can um, pretty easily see what's going on in there. All right, I think we're going to do one more example here and then we're going to come back with a second video. This video is starting to run long already. So let's look at drawing two vectors in space. Use these ve two vectors and then sketch the following. So I'm going to give you the vectors because they're not there. So let's say that vector A looks something like this. We'll call that vector A. And then vector B looks like this. That's vector B. So first of all, I want to draw vector A. I'm sorry, I want to do part A, which is just 2 times vector A. Well, 2 times vector A would be, remember that multiplication is repeated addition, same, same idea, so it's going to be vector A, vector A. That whole thing right there would be 2A. Part B, if I want to do half of vector B, well, that's just going to be taking vector B and making it half as long. So, like that maybe. Well, probably a little longer than that. Maybe like that. That is one half of vector B. Same direction, half the length. Okay, vector, excuse me, part C says we want to do the negative of vector A. Well, the negative just changes the direction. So it's going to be exactly the same as vector A, but the opposite direction. Okay. Again, I don't think these are too difficult. You just kind of have to piece them together. Now we'll get into one that gives us a little bit more math to deal with. Part D wants us to do A plus three Bs. So I'm going to draw vector A first. And then I want to do three vector Bs, which is going to look maybe something like this. You know, I'm not going to draw this perfectly to scale, but the resultant vector would be that one right there. That would be A plus 3B. And then the last one, letter E, 2A minus B. So I want to draw two A's which is going to look something like this. We've already done two A's. And then minus B. Well, adding B would be going up. A minus B is the same thing as doing plus a negative B. So we're just going to change the direction of B. And instead of going up, it's going to go straight down. So the resultant vector there in blue would go from the tail to the tip of the last one. So that would be 2a minus b. Okay, and that's all there really is to sketching vectors. Just make sure you um, um, keep it in the proper perspective. All right, we'll come back with another video and hopefully that will finish off the lesson.